Today on the podcast, I'm so excited. We're going to do a book discussion or colloquium with the bowlers. And they are longtime veteran trainers and phenomenal leadership education gurus. Yes, we can call you gurus. That. <laughs> and we're, I'm so grateful for them to come on here and discuss with us the book. It's recent. It just came out in October of last year, I think, of The Fourth Turning is Here. So for our hero and sword mentors, they read that book. I don't think any other project has to read it. I'm just off the top of my head. I don't think any other project. Well, and they're also reading the old book, not the new right. one. So yeah. maybe we could change that this year. I don't know. But anyways, so super excited about this book because it's it's the sequel to The Fourth Turning. And this The Fourth Turning was written, what, 20 years ago? 20 something years ago? In the 90s. In the 90s. Yeah. So it was like 30 years ago. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's the sequel and it was super good, super awesome. And we're very excited to discuss it. So I'm going to go ahead and just jump in with my first question. Okay. This is something that I've really been struggling with and I'd love to discuss it. So I'm going to give a little bit of back story to, um, to my question so that it has, it makes more sense. So they're recently in the, I think it's a, called a journal of its nature it's called nature and it's a it's an academic journal there was published a a, a paper called assembly theory and I, don't, I mean unless you're like a biologist and you're into reading really difficult journals you probably have never heard of it <laughs> but basically what this theory is is it's how evolution evolution works mm -hmm. and it's pretty if, if it's true it's pretty groundbreaking it's it's very interesting but one of the things that is a premise for this theory is that every living creature has free agency or agency to act. Um, and that it is upon the acting of one living organism upon another living organism that causes the process of evolu evolution. So if this is right, and this is, we don't know yet, if everyone has agency to act, then how is it even possible for there to be cycles in history if we all get to choose how we live our lives and how we act? Does that make sense? Yes, totally makes sense. So do you Fun have question. any thoughts on that? That's I kind know. of a deep question, but that's literally it what is. I'm struggling with. <laughs> it is. So yeah. I have two brilliant minds here. I'm just going to pick them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And in fact, we were, yeah, we were talking with a couple of our kids about this generational theory from Strauss and Howe that they're they the, read they're the, brilliant ones. the previous book. Yeah. And, and it is, it, it brings up that question. Does that mean that, you know, everything's deterministic, that we don't get a choice that it, I mean, it basically doesn't even matter. Just look and see what year you're born. And then we're going to tell you your future. <laughs> so you're born, you know, in the unraveling and so then that means blah 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 and and yeah I mean even as I'm reading this book I remember thinking like as as he's talking about well then if you're a nomad in a crisis then that means probably things aren't going to be so great for you and blah 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 and I remember I was just feeling like well that's lame like why did I get the bad deal being a nomad <laughs> and you know so much of it, it of course he's always also saying like here's the positives here's the negatives so so good, you know, what does that mean? I mean, there's, I, I think you can look at cycles in, I mean, nature is one of the things that I think is, is good to look at with cycles. So, so you have the cycles that are in nature and, you know, using that very theory you're talking about. So, so you have all these different animals, you have all these plants and you've got the weather and all of those kinds of things going on in nature. And if these plants actually get to decide and yet does it matter because they were, you know, started to sprout up when it wasn't quite their time. And so they're going to die. <laughs> no, I, you know, I, I don't know. I think there, I think there are kind of the sh my short answer would be that there are some things that you don't have control over. I mean, I think we tell our kids that all the time. It's like, well, everything can't be fair. You can't, you can't decide precisely if your friend wants to play with you. You know, you can't decide what kind of food they're going to have at the grocery store. <laughs> I don't know. You know, there's a lot of things you can't always decide. You can't decide if COVID's going to shut down your world, but, but there's always things that are within your control. And, and that's where you have your agency in, in any, in any system, you know, whether it's your home, you know, within your home as children, 
you can't decide maybe how late you're going to stay up or maybe you can, you know, you can't decide what media you're going to watch depending on who your parents are, but, but you can decide some things, maybe what you wear, maybe, you know, what you do with your free time, you know, certain things like that. So there's my, there's my short answer. Yeah. When I, when I think about that and I think about what's happening in society, right? That's kind of the basis of Strauss and Howe's theory is that what's happening in society as a whole has a certain feel to it as you go through each season and and that because of what's felt in that particular season mm -hmm. then it has a stereotypical effect on on society as a whole and yet each actor each individual inside society is still choosing what they want to choose but because as a whole or by and large society is feeling this way because of what's happening in the cycle it causes similar outcomes even though individuals are making their own choices uh, what, I, I was gonna say what are you yeah. thinking about that Dottie? <laughs> <laughs> i'm trying to i'm just trying to like compartmentalize it because epiphany that i had you're saying you know if you look at it more you know it, he does talk about it as a season but if i'm let's just take any organism if like like amy said if i'm a plant and the sun there's a really good bouts of weather in february and i sprout up before i should because it's warm then when i get snowed on i'm quite not gonna make it right but mm -hmm. i didn't have as a plant even though i i can i can act and choose to act well i can't choose an act but i i, I act out the genes inside of me right whatever you know the the, the makeup of the seed then, but I don't get to have any influence on what the sun does or what the clouds do or what, or the rain or the, you know, the ozone effect or whatever. I, I don't have any control over that, but I do know that for the last forever hundred million years, the sun has gone around, the, the earth has gone around the sun and, the, and on an axle. So it tilts, so there will be seasons, you know? So like, I do know that it's going to be the process. So my genes have been replicated over years and years, years to, to make it so I can flourish, right? And, and grow. So I think what the pivot I had is like, yes, we have the ability to act in agency, but there are external forces you don't have control over. Like, yeah. and nobody really has control over them. So yeah. I think maybe what How is saying is that these forces, like just what Kent was saying, they're a pattern that happen over The forces over. in society. Yeah. yeah. Those external forces that are happening in our culture yeah. and, and they affect us and the thing that just this analogy popped into my mind you think about when you have a baby and you try to name the baby and those names they follow trends and and we are like we don't try to follow those trends with our when we've named our babies we're not I, we're not trendy like that like right? oh i'm gonna follow the trend right like what we, are names? we don't look up like the most popular name we try to get actually more unique names so it's not like we're naming our kids the same thing. And yet we have an Emma and there's bajillions of Emmas, even though we named her after an she ancestor. She was special. She was our she only was very Emma. very unique and special. But I think that's an example. I mean, it's not like, I mean, we had a choice. We felt like we were making that choice independent of the society and the culture. And yet we, I strongly believe we were highly influenced because when a later child came along and we actually wanted to name them with a name starting with F, because we were sort of going alphabetical, long story, but we were trying to think of an F name and we actually had a business meeting. We had a meeting with your work. So and I was a manager and we had they had we had this party and for the baby. And everybody in my work group were trying to come up with F names for yeah, us. It was terrible. There were like no good F names. And we we've we ditched the F. We were like, there are no good F names. And I'm sure that was like a societal thing because I don't know, 50 years ago, there probably were a lot of F names. I don't know. <laughs> but I Franklin, think, Franklin was like, right, you know, but not, Frank, yeah. And, and Frank was but like not anymore. Family, right. That was a family name. And so, yeah, but, but there were, there were a lot of, and, and I think that it's cultural too, because you could look at some other, other cultures would be like, oh yeah, you could have done this, this, and this, and Anyway, so I, I think it's interesting that even when we feel like we're not 
influenced and we're really trying not to be like we're influenced but, we, and we then really you look are. at you look at our kids having or naming their kids and and like our oldest is like, well we're, we're naming naming our kids after kings that's really cool and guess what all their names that they named their kids that are super unique king names from ancient history match what all the trends are <laughs> so much for being unique again <laughs> Right, but that's but those are that's... the external forces that are real, and and as as we go through these cycles in society, those things that we feel are real, and and what you mentioned in your, in your podcast a couple of weeks ago talking about that is that right now we're in a crisis and it feels differently. What we feel is is way heavy, and it it doesn't feel like a spring, it doesn't feel like a summer, it doesn't right, it's different. And and we feel that. And because we feel that, we act differently. So right now the yeah. trend as parents is we're protecting our kids. <laughs> and and that's what they call out in both books, right? That as we go through that crisis, it's tough. And so we're trying to protect our kids from what we see happening in the world. We feel the weight of, of that crisis. And, and we're trying to shelter and protect our kids from that. And so they they come up differently than how I grew up or how you grew up, Tati, right? Because Oh yeah. I mean, I it's it's so interesting because I was 14 when 9-11 happened, which I don't think he necessarily says is like the catalyst of the crisis in this book. I think he precursor. He, precursor. precursor it's a precursor. Saying. That's a precursor. Yeah. yeah. So he says it's a precursor, <clears throat> right? And I have a very distinct memory of after 9-11, nothing was ever the same for my childhood there was a just was a shift like I went from being able to like experience a lot of freedom and there wasn't a lot of mm -hmm. stress to now there was a lot more stress and my parents did a really good job just try to just you know keep us not worrying or stressing about that but so many people in my neighborhood were greatly infected by you know especially the financial crash of 08 my my friends being in college like if there just was a it was a it was a big shift and, and, and you could feel it like it wasn't it was almost just like the whole world went, just started being like, now what's the point of like living? Like, I know mm -hmm. that's not, that's how it felt. Like, you yeah. know, there was that patriotism and there was that fight, but it was just this big shift of like, everything went insular and closed down. And, and it's, I don't think I've ever, because I was 14, I do remember before then, but if you were born before then, you wouldn't know what life was like before you know like i remember but, going into the airport multiple times as my grandparents would fly in and we'd wait there with signs right by the uh, gate and be so yeah, happy to see the them gate. and then you know now it's like everyone's so Can't afraid and it's massive lines and it's like this you know horrible ordeal to get through and it's like that's when like you could definitely say this is this was a market change in how we feel mm -hmm. we no longer feel safe yeah but did you, Tati, have the ability to make your own choices? Did you have agency going through <laughs> pre-9-11 and post-9-11? Yeah, I, I think my choices were limited to some extent, especially because mm -hmm. I'm an older millennial. I'm not, let's see, because I was born in 87. So yeah, yeah I'm like- Older the, millennial, yeah. Yeah, I'm an older millennial. And so when my husband and I graduated from college, we, still was a really rough you know job market and mm -hmm. still recovering and so then by the time we could like afford a house <laughs> they were no longer affordable but like I think so like there were definitely impacts that have impacted me growing up and and how I the availability of choices like one of the things that he was talking about in the book is like how the silent generation was super confused as to why the other generations couldn't follow the rules and have the same success <laughs> you know it's like well because you got a different like you were handed something completely different than us yeah. but so the I think it limited were different yeah they were they were, different. were in a different season yeah but I also grew up in an age where like technology was so advanced that when COVID hit and my husband was home for, you know, mandatory, he still had a job. We still have our money and he worked from home because of technology, you know? So it's like, yes, we were hit by things, but we had other things that impact us. So I definitely would say I always had, had choice. I think the difference though, is like it, some choices, I feel like for, if you were in, in the millennial generation and you're a hero, 
you have to make those harder choices consciously. Mm. Like, for example, like, I think a lot of my generation is like, kids are too hard to raise. So I'm not going to have kids. It's not financially viable. Like someone said Mm. that in order for you to have a kid, it's like $250,000 per kid from beginning to end. Like some ridiculous number because, you know, you have to pay for their, you know, all these things. I was like, no, you can, you don't have, that's not how much money it costs to raise a kid. Trust me, I've got a 10 year old and we've never, we've never made that much money ever. (laughs) um, So I definitely think that as a millennial, it's those choices were harder to make, but you could still make them. That makes sense. Right. And and there's an example of you choosing to have multiple children within your generation, even though the trend is more toward the, the baby bust, no cycle opposite of baby boom. And, and yet you uh, and your family, you can choose to go against that trend. So yeah, I think, and and parents say that to us all the time, like, well, but I see my artist generation child, he acts much more like hero. So I don't think this model works or it doesn't, what does that mean? And it's like, it's okay. He just doesn't, he doesn't follow the norms of what the society is, or, or at least you aren't seeing it yet. I mean, if he's 13, 14, Maybe you're going to see more of it later. He also has only lived, you know, a very small portion of his life. And probably, especially if he's been homeschooled or really sheltering family, hasn't felt a lot of the influence of society. So, yeah, I think it's, I, I love the question, Taji. I think it's really well, fascinating. I think it's really interesting, too, that as you were just talking about that in your last little snippet response, you were talking to the seasons, the season that we're in. So for heroes right now in the crisis, economics are crushing. And and that's what they feel more than any other of the four archetypes. The hero generation feels that the economics is overwhelming. It's too much. It can't happen. Or it's not that it can't happen. It's just really, really hard. And so the sentiment that you're expressing from other parents that I can't afford to have a baby right now, that's that's across the whole society. I mean, it, it's it's stereotypical, right? So by and large, that's what a lot of people feel and that's what a lot of people are doing. Yeah, you can actually like if the book Nine Boys in a Boat, that the story that it tells about, like that follows the story of a lot of the boys, but the main one, um, I can't remember his name, but that's like basically, I'm like, oh my gosh, yeah. He, he went through the same same viewpoint of like it's too difficult financially to be alive and so that's why he ended up going on the boat he was a you know he was a hero generation as well older hero generation okay but but so as you're talking about like yeah you can as i'm looking back at this stories i know of heroes from world war ii you know the greatest generation that's I think you're right like yeah they also felt that same pressure but there was might have been also like it's also not safe to have children (laughs) right right but I I mean I've heard that sentiment expressed as well just like the safety oh yeah yeah same kind of thing economics and and oh my gosh you're right I totally have heard that from my friends I can yeah yeah, they'll they'll say things like is it even worth bringing children into this really decrepit horrible world Right. Yeah. And so going back to your very first question, right? It's not that it's deterministic. It's that this is what is being felt as a whole across society. And so when we were, I'm, I'm digressing a little bit, reading through the book again, it was like, oh my goodness. Yes, yes, yes. Right. He's talking about the stereotypical things and what and what each generation feels. And they're talking about me, the nomad. I'm like, yes. That's how I was raised. Those are the things I felt. Yeah. And yeah, both of us like smacked up kind of middle, middle nomad 71, 67. So, um, and nomads, I think are born 61 to 81. Yeah. Both of us to- really different childhood grew up on different sides of the country, California, different economic Virginia. Situation, but we came out with the same kind of things because as a whole society was experiencing those things together. Right. And it's the same thing today as we go through this season in the crisis. And and so it affects how we parent, whether you're a nomad or a hero. It affects what our kids feel. And and by and large, again, stereotypically, (laughs) archetypally, that's what they're feeling. Oh, go ahead, Heidi. Go ahead. 
I, I think it's interesting, though. I think one of the most powerful things about this book is that by understanding this, we can do something about it. I recently read the book Slaughterhouse-Five because one of my students read it and we were talking about it. And in that book, the main character knows the future. And so he knows what's going to happen to him and he doesn't do anything about it. And that just really upset this student of mine because it's like, you know, why didn't he, you know, like his, his wife has an accident. And so why didn't he tell his wife, Mm -hmm. you know, that this was going to happen? Why did he just allow these things to happen if he knew it was going to happen? And so the fourth turning is here. It's not saying, yeah, oh, this is going to happen, but it gives us kind of insight into what might happen. And I think that's really where it gives us the agency. We can do something about it. We don't have to just be caught in that stereotype. We can move out of it if that's something that we choose to do. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, when I read this book back in October, first of all, I feel like it added a lot more than the original book did, which was really fun for me because I'm kind of a history buff. So that was really fun. But the last chapter, I feel like was one of the most liberating, you know, 50 pages <laughs> I've read in a long time. Because yeah. to me, like the epiphany that I walked away with, like, I am raising children in the most difficult time it is to raise children. And I'm doing a kick butt job doing it just because I'm doing it. You know, it was, it was super liberating to me to be like, even though it feels oppressive and it feels hard and it is hard. The reality is it's hard. It's really hard. I'm not raising kids in the sixties. I'm raising them in the 2020s. And there's a reason why it's so hard because that's the cycle we're in and it's okay. And it's okay that it's not easy, but I get to choose how I'm going to, to weather this through. And so actually I was like, let me go back to my family history and look at what my great grandparents did because they would have been raising kids during the crisis as well Mm -hmm. right and so I put and I looked it up and my great-grandmother my grandfather was so poor when they first got married that he he got a job at a teeny country shop up a canyon up a canyon so they didn't even have like a car to get there they had to take horses to get there they lived in a tent on the back of the store Mm. and then they had oh I mean this would have been like Okay, so it would have been the 20s, would have been yeah. the 20s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right, right before the Great Depression, but like right, right around there. Yeah, they were feeling it. Yeah, yeah, because my grandfather was born in 37. So and he's number four. So yeah, it would have been like, like the 19, like right around the Great Depression, right when it started. Yeah. And so they 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 weren't heroes. They were obviously older, but they were raising kids right that time period. And I find out like, After six months of living in this tent, she has a baby. It's Mm. winter. They're living in a tent Mm. in winter in Utah in a canyon. And the tent catches on fire and burns to the ground. And here's my great grandmother with a newborn baby in the middle of winter with no home. And I'm just like, okay, you know what? I don't give a crap. It's like, it's extremely <laughs> expensive or my kids get to go without any extracurricular events or whatever. I'm not living in a tent in the canyon in the winter with a newborn. You know, like it was really inspiring to me to be like, this is what the the past, the past tier generation had to go yeah. through. And this is what they raised their. And so, you know, then you like read about the stories from World War II and you're like, hey, you know what? None of my babies are being asked to be, you know, I'm, I'm going to count my blessings and just be really grateful. And so that's one of the things I, I really, really love this book and encourage anyone to read it because it's very liberating because you're like this has happened before and that's one of the things he says at the end remember that i said crises have always happened and they're beautiful things when we choose the higher road through them and it was very like that that was super inspiring to me it's like yeah the season happened nobody wants to keep living where we're at we need to change right Right. And, and it's so natural. And I love, I love that story, Tati. And I love when he's, I can't remember which chapter it is. I think it was, you know, one of the later ones where he's talking about the winter and kind of going through each of the generations that have gone through other crises. And he focuses on that last seculum and those, those who are living in the time before World War II and then World War II, you know, which is basically the past time, the past 
fourth turning and 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 just basically saying this is what the hero generation did this is how the last artist generation got through the fourth turning and you know and and a lot more of of course it's a different generation as he's writing this book versus the other one but a lot more of we don't exactly know what will happen but but those are patterns we can look at and get some perspective i love that you got that perspective from your great grandparent that's really cool yeah i was i'm pretty lucky to have a my grandmother was an avid historian so she collected <sighs> all the stories and put them in books for us so and mm -hmm. very grateful cool. for that but i think it's also what I was going to say, I had an epiphany. I think Kent said something and earlier. And what I realized is that cause and effect is a principle that none of us can deny. Like, you know, it's a it's a Newton's laws of, of physics, right? Every action has an equal and opposite reaction, right? So we know that's a universal law. And so the epiphany I had when you said this is a higher cultural impact, right? But it, it, it has to happen because if you have a high, there has to be a decline and then there has to be a rebirth and then there has to be a crisis and then there'll be another high, right? It's a cause and effect of just things happening. And and so I kind of, I've struggled with Strauss and Howe in the past because I've, I there's a, the other way of looking at history is the dialectic, right? Which is like, which is basically, we have a thesis and an antithesis, which then, no, no, no. That's not how it goes. The thesis yeah, is the antithesis. Okay, yeah. The thesis antithesis. and the antithesis. And then out of that stems the next branch, right? And then, then you know, Hegel basically says, if we keep on this path, we'll become superhumans. And we'll become evolve. gods, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Basically, yeah, that's Hegel's dialectic, right? So then the other way is like, we're just always going forward, always moving and progressing. Always learning from our mistakes and always yeah. getting better and progressing. Yeah. And, and we never repeat. But then I'm like, okay, but that violates so many natural laws that I also know are existence because like cause and effects is a real thing. And if we're prideful, we fall. Mm -hmm. So like, and if, if we usually don't become prideful till we become, you know, we reach a status of this elevated height. So like this, that, to me, this, the mm -hmm. cyclical way of looking at things makes more sense than the linear because of that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what do you say to people who are like, there are no patterns or there's no way mm. to predict the future or all of this is just like, like bunk. Like what are you, what are your thoughts on that? Wake up. <laughs> In a very diplomatic way. Wake up carefully. <laughs> Kindly wake up. <laughs> no, it's just, I mean, you just, you look at nature and that's not how nature operates, right? Nature goes through the seasons and it's the same every year. Right. It goes and it goes and it goes. And 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 yeah, it's it's tempting for us as humans to think that we're all that, that we are capable of not repeating past mistakes <laughs> and always improving. And and especially as modern, postmodern, whoever we are today, <laughs> right? We we want to go that route and, and think and pat ourselves on the back with that kind of accolade that we have that capacity. And because we've been evolving for thousands of years, we have that capacity. But when, again, going through the book and, and you look at those examples and, and what they're feeling and what they're going through, it's like, and it just resonates. And it's like, yeah, it, it, it totally makes sense. And yeah, I'm sorry. sorry. Go ahead. He, he talks about it early in the book when he's giving support for his theory is that as it's, that's actually normal for us as modern people Our almost all of our technology is an attempt to overcome the natural cycles. I mean, you take the electric light bulb, that's the natural cycle of day and night. You've got a uh, food in the grocery store, refrigeration, that's going to, you know, the cycles that we get. We eat pineapple. There are no pineapple trees in Utah. No, there's all kinds of things like that that are not, or even just like the car, you know, this transportation that we can do where we can drive somewhere in a day that would take weeks in the past. So it just, we've, we've attempted to erase the cycles, but in, you know, for good intent, obviously, you know, pineapple is delicious. And so... <laughs> 
we want to have, you know, some of these conveniences so that, but it doesn't erase the fact that there is still a natural cycle. And, and there's actually a lot of modern evidence too, just that, oh, we should dim our lights more at night. We shouldn't keep them on. I mean, we all know we should keep the lights on at midnight when we're trying to go to sleep. And yet, yeah, should we, there's more cyclical things being talked about. And, and so I think it's, it's just realizing that just because we've overcome some of these cyclical hindrances, doesn't mean they're not there. Those cycles are still happening in nature and same thing in our culture. And and I think also, I think there's a little, we kind of talk about this <laughs> in some of the things we teach parents is that you can have like a, a spiral um, a little bit different than a cycle that's just like the circle repeating itself, but more of like this upward spiral thing. So it's like you're coming back to this new high, but hopefully with this new high, we aren't going to be as discriminatory or as you know, racist as we were maybe in the last high. Maybe we will we will have our things be similar in different ways. It doesn't have to be in in that kind of detrimental way. So it so I think it's almost like well you can have progression within the cycles. So I like to look at it that way. Yeah, hopefully, you know, as we head into this next crisis, we'll have learned about what Hitler tried to do and not do that same thing. Yeah. Right? Hopefully we can we can know that this happened in the past and know that this is something that humanity struggles with and, and choose differently and make a different path. So then brings me yeah. to my next question, which is, I mean, the last part of the book, he gives a couple of things that could possibly happen, you know, and it's just conjecture. Of course, everything's conjecture. Yeah. But one of the main things he says is, is a civil war. And so I want to actually take this to like a more personal level. Because I really feel like we can, yeah, I mean, I live in Kentucky. We well, actually, when I moved to Virginia, this is a funny story. It illustrates the Civil War idea pretty strongly. When I moved to Virginia for school, we show up to this little small town and they say, oh, we're, we're having a little meeting for everybody who's new to the town so you can get familiar with this place you've never been before. So we show up and this this lady who's lived there for her whole life in a small part of backwoods in Virginia, she, she tells us, she's like, okay, we just want to familiarize you where you are and where you live. And I'm like, well, I thought we just lived in Buena Vista. And she's like, no, we're valley people. Valley people <laughs> like mountain people, but they don't like novos. But you have to be careful because mountain people don't always like valley people. I'm like, wait, what the heck? Like, how are there different people? But it's like literally like 20 miles that way and 40 miles that way. Now we're different people. Like, and so it was like very clear to me. And then as I lived there longer, I was like, you're right. I don't like Novos. They're a bunch of pain in the butts. And then it's like, oh, and everyone just tolerates the beach people. That's what she called the people who live on the beach. It's like, what? It's a state. It's wow. like not a huge thing. Right. And then she's like, and, you know, just be careful. This one, she, she, she told us, never go down any mountain road. You don't know the owner of the private road because you get shot. <laughs> I was like, okay, <laughs> we'll leave the mountain people alone. <laughs> like, <God laughs> <God. laughs> but but it was a clear illustration to me because, like, I, I feel like there there is this idea of, oh, this is my tribe. I'm a valley person. You know, we live in the mm -hmm. Shenandoah Valley. You live over here. You're that person. Yeah. And so like, if I live in Kentucky right now, I could say, oh, I could definitely associate with people in the South, you know, and I could definitely be really angry at the people like California. Like generally, I think everybody here. Heidi. So, yeah, sorry, <laughs> Heidi, but I'm pretty sure everybody in Kentucky doesn't like California, you know, like so we can label each other as these things. But the real tragedy of civil war is the fact that it's the brothers that fight the brothers. Mm -hmm. Like that's the real tragedy of civil war. Yeah. So how do you, like, knowing that that's a thing that can happen, in, that does happen. It just, it does. Civil wars cause family ruptures. Yeah. How do you prepare your children for that as you raise them in the crisis? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a great question. And, and that's, I mean, you talked about it in the book that, and in the earlier chapters and leading up to what's going on in the fourth turning in these polarized political opinions and how, you know, a decade or 20 years ago, 
it'll be like, oh, I believe this. Oh, okay, I believe this. And now it's like, you believe that? I don't even know if I can talk to you anymore. I mean, like, oh my goodness, wow. Wow. And and it really is. It's like a it's just like a violent polarization. Even just, I mean, we feel it right now in our society. That's like, I mean, even if you start going Trump Biden, I mean, like, I I'm sorry to even like mention those names in public because because just those names are just Polarizing. divisive in a really, really strong way. And and so how do we and I think, you know, even even like as homeschoolers, there's some, you know, sometimes we use kind of divisive language with with our own children like homeschooling is the best it's amazing like it's the best I do love it <laughs> and that's why I do it you're not going to do it if it's like this is it's just a fun walk in the park but but is there you know language that we can use that's not I'm better than you you're worse than me is there more unifying language and I mean one of the coolest things is to is that this coming generation that we're raising right now, this artist generation, they are actually don't resonate with that kind of polarizing talk. They are much more about the community. They want to come together. They don't want to alienate other people, much less than nomads and heroes. They're they're like, let's let's smooth things over. And so so that's more us as parents, like our our tendencies are to be that way. And and so I think I think it's it's just kind of uh, even just talking about it, even just being aware and being like, I can have a strong conviction without being mad at someone else who has a different conviction. Yeah, that's good. I think it's it's awareness. I was just thinking about about a month ago, my siblings and I, we did an adult getaway. And it's a thing that we do on a traditional annual basis kind of thing. And in this last getaway, well, the year before we missed, but this last one, not everybody came. And it was absolutely because of divisiveness. Mm. And we're talking about my generation, right? So most of them are nomads. Some of them might be heroes. I think they're all nomads. Yeah. Anyway, we grew, we grew up in the same home with mm-hmm. the same parents. And yet, as we've gone through society and 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 we're we're feeling all this stuff that's happening in our culture, right? Some people have gone this way and some people have gone a different way. And it's and it's totally divided. But if we can be aware of that and be cognizant of it, especially with our own children that, yeah. that we're raising in our home, we can let love prevail. Let work on that connection and keep that connection whole so that we know that we love each other regardless that we, and, and, and being aware of the fact that we make mistakes even, and that's okay that none of us are perfect. And when someone makes a mistake and does something stupid or that offends or hurts that we forgive and, and let go. Yeah. Yeah. And, and even, even listening to our kids, especially as they get older, becoming teenagers and, no, what do you think? What do you think about this that's going on? I mean, I know at least in our house, we're very opinionated. And so it'll be like, oh my goodness, blah, blah, blah. And if we will kind of keep our mouths shut a little bit and listen to them, what do you think about this? We're going to hear the the wisdom of this artist generation who is like, well, I mean, I can see why they would be upset about that. I can see why they would believe that this is the right course of action, even though we believe differently, or I can see you mom believe differently. You know, there's been times when, yeah, I've been just blown away by the wisdom of just even our younger children, you know, young teenagers who say something like, Oh, you know, who are we to judge? You know, those kinds of things. I'm like, we definitely, Oh, you're right. Yeah. (laughs) Who are we to judge? Yeah. Okay, well, but I'm going to play a little devil advocate here yeah, because yeah. it's like, I feel like the pain the that that heroes or, or nomads who are adults in this crisis, right, and leaders in this crisis, their primary motivation, there's a song that just came out, you've probably seen it if you're like on YouTube or TikTok at all, but it's called, Please Don't Take These Beautiful Things Away From Me. 
and I, I mean if you're on there you you hear you hear it's a, it's like a big deal on tiktok but it's called beautiful things and it's basically this guy's like you know i've worked so hard and i've got i finally and the last four years have been so hard and i finally have a place in my life where i get to be with my family and i'm in a good place and i have a beautiful girl but god gives and god takes please don't take these beautiful things from me so i feel like from as a perspective of a of a, a millennial I'm, I'm going to just be honest. Sometimes fear is my primary motivator. Mm -hmm. So I'm that's afraid. Generational. <laughs> no, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. Generational. <laughs> I, sometimes I'm afraid that if I show any tolerance to the opposing mm -hmm. side, they'll completely take it away. Right. Mm -hmm. Th that, that if I give an inch, I'm going to lose everything. Right. So, so I guess my question to, to follow up to that is like, if, if, and, and, but the thing is like, I've seen people lose everything. I've seen people lose everything. I mean, I literally have experienced, I'm literally experiencing like families falling apart, horrible things happening to people I love very close to me, lose literally everything, everything yeah. they've built. Because in my opinion, they went this path that I was like, draw hard line, not don't go that you're going to lose it all. <laughs> don't play with fire you're gonna get burned really bad like so so my gut reaction is to just be like just put up a wall and be like we have to defend from this because it this is going to destroy you know just don't take these beautiful things that i've i've worked so yeah. hard to build so going forward you know like if, if i look back on the last civil war what motivated people to fight their brother i think was the same fear Mm -hmm. I've worked so hard to build this beautiful thing and you're going to take it away from me. And so I'm like, how do I overcome that generational fear? Or it's if just, to the, yeah, go ahead. If you, if you listen to the political campaigning that's happening right now, it's totally the same thing. It's all mm -hmm. fear mongering. And if you vote for the opponent, you're going to lose everything that you've worked so hard to get. That's the message. I mean, that's what most advertising is too today. It's like, if you don't buy this, you will never have this ever, ever. Not in 30 seconds when the next ad comes. No, you won't. You'll never get it. Yeah. So what's the, what's the overcoming of that fear? Because it's all around us. Yeah. I, I, I think we have to, I think we have to do work to heal heal from negative emotions that come up we have to we have to process them we have to be aware of it like you just saying i i feel fear for this like i think sometimes it's just an awareness and i think being aware that you're afraid of this is valuable and you can say okay like i don't want to live my life in fear but i am afraid okay what's the valid concern that led to fear Okay, I can I can look at this valid concern. Is there something I can do about it? Am I afraid the sun won't come up? Is it completely unreasonable? Or am I afraid of something that actually could happen? And it is a possibility. Okay, what, you know, let's go down that path. I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can deal with your fear. You no, know, there's so many schools of thought on that. But I think I think we actually have to face it. And and I and I think actually our world is tending that way, the younger generation, in being more emotionally aware and mature in in dealing with the in with those negative emotions and not just letting it I mean I know I was raised like oh that's a little too negative under the rug it goes and cover it back up like it's okay let's let's talk about it what I mean I was I was having a conversation with some moms the other day it was like at a after a church meeting and they weren't completely familiar with the Lemmy projects, but we were talking about all the worldviews that we were discussing and how we were teaching these teenagers from Quest 3 about these worldviews. And they were like, you know, and our, our teenage daughter was there too. And she's, you know, talking about how I'm so glad that I'm learning about these different views. And I mean, there's an example of helping to build bridges with other people who believe differently, very strong differences. And she was like, I am so grateful that I'm learning at a young age 
what I believe and a better understanding for other people's belief. And these parents were like, what? You're teaching them about this and you're teaching them about this and this. And they were, you know, because some, of their fear, they could believe them, that we were teaching them something other than the standard Right. what you're talking about right this has to be the right. the place that we defend they were like you know what you know this was an yeah. understanding it's aren't like, you afraid that you're going to lose what if yeah what if they don't believe in god anymore what if they don't believe in capitalism what if you know these uh, these things that are like you know gospel truth as for lack of a better word but i mean i think it's it's something we got to talk about and just be like I, and i think this rising generation needs more than ever for us to answer their questions, to explore with them. And, and those, you know, those of us in the more parental mentor role to say, okay, even though kind of, it, it seems a little scary, um, you know, what's, what's the fear based on and, and is there truth to it? Because I think sometimes there actually could be truth to it. And it, and it actually needs to be something that you should be wary of just like the examples you're, you know, giving a little bit of, friends who have, you know, gone down this path, it's like, okay, that was horrific. And, you know, once again, especially as our teenagers get older, we can talk to them about it and, and be like, okay, you know, we see or read this article about somebody who did this or that. And it's like, where was the cause and effect? You know, they chose this and then what happened? And, and I don't know, I, I, I feel you. He talks a lot about millennials with anxiety. Like it's a real, real thing. And, and I think we've got to just, just face it and say, okay, I've got this and, and it's a real concern and what am I going to do with it? And I mean, we teach our kids and we teach parents like processing tools. And we actually teach parents that you have got to process your fear, anger, frustration about yourself and about your children specifically so that when they make mistakes, you can face it calmly and not like, what? <laughs> and yeah, so I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a hard thing. Yeah. Fear is a, it's a powerful emotion and it's, it's hard to go against that fear or to get rid of that fear mm -hmm. to allay that fear somehow. And and as you're asking that question, I, I thought of two examples so just a couple of days ago, I was in the middle of a conversation with a mom who's got, I don't know, a 10 and an eight year old and they're on the spectrum and she just got divorced and she's in this place where she feels like there's no hope for her mm -hmm. and all that she sees and all that she feels is massive fear, right? And, 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 and we can put ourselves in her shoes and go, yeah, right. That's what she's going through is, is really hard and she doesn't know how she's going to turn out. And, and so she's got this massive fear. And then the other thing that popped in my mind, we were just watching the chosen last night. I think it was, we love that show. And so there's this episode where, where, Oh, Jesus is taken in shackles by the Romans. They question him, and, and the disciples are just beside themselves. They're going nuts out of fear. And before he goes, I mean, he's, he's, he's in handcuffs, isn't the right word, right? But he's, he's chained and, and taken off. But as he's going off, he tells them, I'll be back, keep doing what you're doing. And, and it's going to be fine. And, mm -hmm. and they were so consumed by fear that they spent all the time until he came back, wrapped up in that fear, not mm -hmm. doing what they've been asked to do. And, and it, it's, it's this interesting dichotomy because mm -hmm. they believe in, Jesus as a powerful person, right? As the Messiah, as the Christ. And yet they don't take him at his word and they're still totally fearful for what's going to happen. And, and so when I was talking to this lady, this mom, what I said to her was, you need to remember that God trusts you. And she just broke down crying. Right, because that thought hadn't occurred to her. Yeah. And so for me, this isn't in the book. <laughs> right. But the way that we displace that fear mm -hmm. is is by trusting a higher source and letting that light back into our hearts to to eradicate the darkness that comes from fear. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, love, love, love that.
and it becomes and then that's where what he does talk about in the book is that that this crisis this extreme darkness hardness becomes one of the best blessings you know the greatest good comes out of this fourth turning as has happened in the last 80 to 100 years and so from the worst things comes the greatest results and and when we when we take that higher road when we're able to face the fear and overcome and yeah look to look to the source of all truth and find that hope it's it's actually so much more rewarding than kind of being in the other seasons where it's just kind of oh it's pretty good it's well maybe taking a downturn you know it's just it's it's more wishy-washy this is like there's it's black and white right there's now. black and white and more and more black and white and yeah you know the thought comes to me as you were talking about that woman and what she's going through i think there's like you know thousands of others parents in the in the similar situation as she's in and the thought came to me of american crisis paper number one and mm -hmm. near the end of it he says you know he showed up at a tavern and he was talking to a guy who runs the tavern and he said he had this really beautiful child with him and the the, the dad said well if there'd be trouble i don't want it let's let's if, this, if we're gonna have to have a war let's have it 20 years from now mm -hmm. And then, you know, you know, Thomas Paine's like, that's the most unfatherly expression you could possibly have. A good father would say, if there's going to be a trial or a hardship, let it be in my day so that my kids can have peace. And so I think one of the things that, you know, nomad parents and hero parents are being called upon right now to do is to fight those battles for their children and raise their children in, in a state where it's a lot of fear and anxiety and pressure and economic hardship and, and you know, all, a lot of other things that are happening in the world right now and decide to fight it. I just listened to this podcast that I really like, The Diary of the CEO, and he had this guy on there who's like SC, uh, SCIA, and he's saying, everybody needs to get out of America. You know, America's in its adolescence and we're like teenagers, we're only like 250 years old. And let's just face it, doesn't give the best opportunities to our children right now because, you know, we're kind of crashing, going downhill. And the, and I listen just like, this is not what the hero generation's response is supposed to be. The hero <laughs> generation is like, whoa, wait, stop this. We're going to change this. We're, gonna we're not it. doing this. We're going to fix this. And the yeah. nomad and the hero generation are being, supposed to be the ones that push us and lead us through this, right? But, yeah. I, you know, the message that a lot of hero generations people are getting is, is you're not strong enough. You can't do it. Yeah. Or let the experts handle this. And so I really, I think in listening to this book, I highly recommend anyone out there, if you don't want to read the whole thing, definitely the last couple of chapters are super good. It yeah. was, I walked away feeling so much hope for the future. No, even though he said, most likely in four years, we'll have a civil war and then a world conflict. Like that's not hopeful, but, right. <laughs> but like the, 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 his overall theme and what you talked about is, 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 and, and I really strongly believe this is as well as like, God put you in here for a reason because he knew you could do it and you would do it. Yeah. So yeah. you can do it. Yeah. Quick comment in the book. I love it. He talks about the fact that the hero generation where they're at right now, they don't, they don't see themselves as heroes per se, mm -hmm. but that when the poop hits the fan, they're going to stand up and act and take care of it and fix it. And so, you know, for us as nomads, we can look at some of the hero generation and go, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> right. Cause all, they're just, all they're doing is playing video games or they're, I mean, it's hard sometimes to see that, but what they, what he calls out is it's happened every time. And mm -hmm. even though it looks like they're not up to it right now, they are, and they will. So it's, it's super helpful. I agree. Yeah. You know, all of us who have gone through tech week, have, <laughs> we know the feeling, <laughs> uh, but we are, we are almost out of time. And I am just, Ken and Amy, I'm so grateful that you've been here. I will definitely put your contact information for uh, revolutionary families in our show notes. But I do want to ask one question of all three of you. When you are preparing for a colloquium with adults, how do you prepare? 
I'm I'm really selfish and I just the way I prepare is I just if I have questions or things I didn't understand or things I want clarity on, I just ask people. I feel like that does two things. It's one, it sets up this expectation of vulnerability at the beginning. Mm. When you can approach somebody and say, I'm struggling with this. It's actually a, a relationship slash like a advanced tactical negotiation skill where you let somebody <laughs> give you something and then mm. in return, they feel like they owe you something. And that usually comes in the response of them being vulnerable back to you. So, I mean, I'm not trying to be coercive or manipulative, but that's, really, it does, it, it, you know, when yeah. you, but I'm genuine, I'm hundred percent genuine. I really am. And yeah. like, I'm thinking and I'm pondering and I'm questioning and I'm going to, and I also am hundred percent genuine when I, I want to literally hear their opinions because I highly value them. Yeah. So it can't be like not genuine, but that's, that's one of the biggest ways that I do it is I come prepared with questions that I'm struggling with or things I didn't understand. And I, I just use the time selfishly to answer. <laughs> questions. Yeah. Well, and, and sometimes if it's, are, are you meaning Heidi, like specifically with adults or with youth too? Specifically with adults. Yeah. I, I mean, I think there's a little bit of a difference, but a lot of times I'm teaching a mom's class right now. And a lot of times I'll just say something a little bit softer, kind of like, what were your epiphanies? What were your insights? You know, did you have any favorite quotes or just a favorite part in here? Just sometimes that can lead out and then people, hopefully also they come after you do multiple, then they start to know that's what we're going to be doing. It's not just me lecturing and that it's going to be discussion like what Tati's saying. And so that then they know, oh, that's, that's the drill. That's what we do is we share. And, and then it, the, it lends itself to them preparing more and better, hopefully, because they know we're going to talk about what they've learned, not just what I learned. Yeah, I've, I really like taking notes in the text in the book that I'm reading and then and then using that as a springboard to do something like what Ati was saying, where I don't I'm not sure about this. I don't get this. I'm confused about this. And, and that's going to drive dialogue so great because we all want to be valuable. We all want to contribute. Right. And so when I'm asking that question about. He says this, but. You know, I, I wrote my book, what, <laughs> what are you talking about? What about this? What about that? Then it really drives that dialogue when people can pipe in and say, well, there's this and there's that. And what about this? Did you think about this? That that can help drive that good conversation. But I would add just that, honestly, through all the colloquiums I've ever led, I've found that the powerful transformational colloquiums happen, not with how well you prepare, but how present you are in the discussion. Mm. Because if I'm mm -hmm. really listening to someone, like really listening with my whole being, then it's like what I've noticed is that epiphanies and truths, like I just start, they just start happening. I start yeah. learning. And and then if I'm genuine with that person, genuine listening to them, then those questions just pop into my mind because I'm present. And I find that the, I think the biggest mistake that people make when they're first trying to do colloquiums is they're so worried about the question that they don't listen to the answer. And yeah. in the answer is your next question. And also in the answer is the relationship that you need to build so that the question, the discussion is rich. Yeah. And, and Tati oh, yeah. modeled that wonderfully today as we went through that discussion, right? She had, she asked these great questions. Then you look at her, she's, she is She's listening, listening, <laughs> listening, right? To what, because yeah, we're going on and on. <laughs> she says something, I say something, and she's still listening. And and then we had a great conversation because we were heard. Yeah. And listen to it, it was good. Well, guys, I, I know you've got to go. And we're just so grateful that you were able to join us today for this amazing discussion. And Thank you guys. What a so great, that was really cool.